In this video, we're going to begin to describe the process of quantum scattering by building up solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation uh, with a Hamiltonian given by this, where VR is the interaction potential between the target and the incident particles uh, in such a way that uh, these stationary scattering states solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So by the end of this video, we're going to have uh, a form for what this wave function should look like based on physical considerations. And to get some intuition for this, we're going to look at one dimensional scattering, which occurs when you have, for example, uh, a step potential and you send in some particles, which will denote by psi incident. Uh, when these particles hit the potential barrier, we get uh, what's known as scattering solutions. So you get uh, a reflected and a transmitted wave. And these uh, we're going to label as, uh, as the scattered waves from this potential. So physically we expect that when a particle hits some potential barrier, this is some VFX, we expect the process to result in some uh, scattered waves. In this region where the potential is zero, we expect the incident waves to be well described by plane waves since they are essentially free particles. So if this is, uh, let's say the Z direction, they will have a form E to the I K Z this K is related to the De Broglie momentum of the quantum particles. So it's related by uh, to the momentum by this equation. And this is because V of X is equal to zero for the incident particles. So we're looking at before it hits the potential well. By analogy in 3D, we are going to uh, place our target at the origin of some coordinate system. This will be our target, it's the origin. Uh, we'll model this target as a potential with some finite range, just like this potential step only is only non-zero for a certain range of X. We are also going to give a finite range to the three-dimensional potential parametrized by this value A. So outside of A, we'll say V of R is zero for R. Uh, so when we're very far from, from the potential for R much greater than A. To this target, we're sending a flux of incident particles. As we said before, the form of this matter wave is expected to be a plane wave because it's very far from the potential. And is traveling in the set direction as per our choice of coordinate system. Once the incident particles hit the target, that's going to result in the production of scattered waves. Which might look something like that. And we'll denote these by 
uh, psi of s. Now, if we focus in uh, when we're very far away from uh, this target, for example, in our coordinate system, it's set is very, very small. So we're over here. In other words, when our potential is equal to zero, uh, the particles far away from this region will have some energy h bar k squared over two mu. Mu here is the reduced mass of our particles. Uh, this is our momentum. And this is because it's a, a free particle. Likewise, uh, this is also the case if uh, the distance from the origin is much greater than A. So for the scattered waves, we also expect them to have uh, this kinetic energy because we're looking at elastic scattering. So the total kinetic energy must be conserved. Under these conditions, the time independent Schrodinger equation can be rewritten as h bar minus h bar square over two mu. Uh, Laplacian plus k squared. k over here is uh, the wave number plus the potential times psi of r in general. So this is the combination of our incident and our scattered waves. And that's equal to zero. We can guess the form of the scattered wave from, again, from physical considerations. These uh, in general will be scattered radially outwards. And you can describe that by e to the, uh, pl by plane waves with e to the i k dot r. K here, it gives you the direction of propagation of the scattered waves dotted with the position vector. To be able to conserve probability, uh, the scattered waves must become uh, weaker in amplitude as they propagate outwards uh, so that the flux of probability remains constant if you look at uh, concentric spheres of larger and larger radius. So if you look at the flux of particles here and you look at the flux of particles there, that has to be the same. Otherwise you're accumulating probability somewhere and uh, violating the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so we know in general, our scattered waves should take on this form. Additionally, uh, there's no reason to believe that in general, uh, that the scattered waves will uh, propagate isotropically. And what I mean by that is there's no reason why the waves will be equally scattered in any given direction, denoted in direction by our spherical angles theta and phi, the azimuthal and polar angles. Okay, so by isotropically scattering, I mean in the same way for all theta and phi. So to take this into account, we're going to add a fudge factor to our scattered waves. which we're going to call F sub K of theta and phi. This quantity is known as the scattering amplitude. In such a way that our general wave function will be composed of 
the incident particles, the wave function due to the incident particles, plus uh, the wave function of the scattered waves. So this is the incident wave function plus the scattered wave function. And this is, uh, since we're assuming that the particles are free, this is only for cases where we're very, very far away from the potential. So that uh, this condition over here is met. And our goal then will be to determine what the scattering amplitude is equal to, because as we'll see in the next video, this scattering amplitude is related to the differential cross section that we saw in the previous video. So it'll tell us uh, a lot of information about the way that the particles are being scattered by uh, this potential. And, and over here, we can drop the vectors and the dot because for these waves, the they will be propagating in the same direction as the unit vector. So uh, this is just KR, they're not vector quantities anymore. So in the next video, we're going to um, explicate the relationship between this uh, scattering amplitude and the differential cross section to motivate why we would be interested in determining what this is.